Let's give her a confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Oh, even our believers overseas, let us say this together. Enlarge the place of our tent. With this word, today's message is entitled, A New Year with Concentration and Challenge. The new year, 2024, has dawned upon us. God has given us the word, enlarge the place of your tent from Isaiah 54 too, as a covenant to be fulfilled. As a priority, our Yewon unity needs to stand as a 237 partisan that possesses all nations. What is the pathway for this? It is the team of three movement. The team of three, three movement. The church needs to enlarge the tent of the church through the Start 10,000 movement and the, and the 4,000 Bards movement that enlarges the tent of the region and the 237 healing movement which enlarges the tent of the 237 fields. May this continuously take place. And through this, The challenge to reach 10,000 believers and establish the 3,000 field word movements and establish a part of 237 missions must take place. That's why we formed the main regional committees and the bone and flesh evangelism themes. But there is a sp platform specifically for experiencing this answer, and that's called enlarging the place of my tent. Inside my tent, there are two main parts. One is enlarging my spiritual tent my spiritual tent and the core point of that is communicating with the word from the pulpit for 24 hours as you apply the pulpit message 24 hours in your life and you meditate on it and you experience the fulfillment of the word when we follow the flow of the word we can we're able to transcend our level of limitations we stand beyond ourselves how does that make sense of course it doesn't make sense but you are able to transcend yourself you're able to transcend your level and limitations and leave a life masterpiece of the 25th hour in eternity when you receive strength from the word it begins from worship from then that is where prayer comes forth and that is where renewal resolution and de determination comes forth third john 1 2 says beloved may things go well as your soul is well like your soul is well this is something that people in the world and unbelievers do not know people who are not saved people who are not of the bible of the of the holy spirit do not know this may all things go well as your soul is well because in the people in the world they don't believe in anything else that's invisible they they don't know the things that are invisible but the Bible says, as your soul is well, your soul needs to be well first. May, your, may all your thoughts and may all your life, may you worship the Lord. May you, oh my soul, worship the Lord. The Bible calls upon the soul. My soul calls upon my own soul. My soul, oh my soul. This is something that only a spiritual being can say. And this is something only spiritual beings can understand. Oh, my soul, are, do you worship? Do you pray? Do you praise? Do you meditate on the word? Oh, my soul, do you communicate with the Lord? Oh, my soul, this needs to take place. And then, then everything else, you're, you're in all your ways. It says it is God's promise that will bless all our other ways. This is the order of blessings. Just as your soul is well, may things, everything go well. So first you must enlarge the tent of your spirituality and you must enlarge the field of your profession. Whether it's your business, your workplace and studies, you must enlarge that tent to stand as summits in each field. When you're in your workplace or your business, just sitting there blankly waiting for you for a payday if you're living a boring and frustrating life with that kind of frustrations you should not be at that level of unbelievers even if you were to sweep the floor you must sweep it as when pharaohs look looked at joseph and he recognized something different in him even if he's cleaning there's something different about him that kind of individual are the ones who receive answers 
even the, when it comes to the workplace, the boss knows. I was a boss once. So I, a boss recognizes that. Oh, that individual, that employee really loves this place, this work, this job, and he's very faithful to this job. And that, or that other individual, he's using humanism. He's trying to get only benefit himself. A boss knows all this. And that is one. Because for the boss, the boss takes his own life to his business. But for the employees, they can go, always change their jobs. And so it, it may be different. But when it comes to you, regardless of whether people may be watching you or not, do your best. And even when you're in your work field, you must stand before God as well. Then what will God do? He will enlarge the tent of your workplace. And for those who do business, you must go all into your business. Do you know how much I went all into my business? When I was doing my business, I did not close my door. I did not close my business even when my parents had passed away. Everyone else, they attended a funeral, but I still maintained normal operations that day. I would go to work earliest and leave my work latest. In the eyes of God, God blessed my business. But people who just moderately want to go into their business, those are the people who fail in their businesses. And that's the people who do businesses. You must really stake your life into your business. It's a grand difference between whether a boss sits in the business or is at work or not. And that's why for people who only go golfing as, as the boss, though their businesses always tend to fail. And that's why when you do your business, you really have to stake your life into it. You know, when I go golfing and I see people who run businesses who are at the head of their business going at go playing golf, I think, I wonder how their business will succeed. And, you know, all they do, they say, oh, God, give me this, give me that. And they say they believe, but what do they believe in? It's all a lie. They don't believe in it. You know, and they try less than people in the world and they say it's because they believe, but what do they believe in? The Bible says, you evil and lazy servant. The people who are to succeed, their DNAs are different. Even for those who are studying in your studies, you, may you enlarge your tent. Even when you enlarge your tent, whether you're smart or not, it doesn't make that much of a difference. How much passion and how much you concentrate, that makes the difference. And environmental things, circumstantial things, whether you have money or not, if it's God's plan, God gives you all that. And so I have experienced this and I'm saying this to you. And so everyone has gone to a business before. Everyone has everyone is working but for myself i did not have enough time to even look at a newspaper while i was working it was a mid-level mid-sized business i had to do everything after college i i was given i went into this job and i was given a quite high position because it was a mid-sized level a mid-sized business and it, i didn't even have any leisure or time to look at the newspaper and so, and you know, um, our, everyone would measure how much time it would take to do one task. So it was a really excruciating training that I had to go through. That my boss, he wouldn't even use a lot of toothpaste. And, you know, he'd watch me put toothpaste on my toothbrush and say, oh, by looking at you, how much toothpaste you use, I could use that for a week. And, you know, I couldn't even walk loudly. My footsteps couldn't be loud. I had to walk really lightly. Your business, your workplace, your studies, in each aspect, may you stand as summits. And that's when God gives you a creative wisdom. Even in your workplace, in your business, God gives you a creative wisdom unlike others. God gives you that creative wisdom. And when you study, you may, perhaps you may not have been, may, perhaps you may have been, not been born with a smart or brilliant mind, but God gives you that creative wisdom. And people say, oh, you're so smart, even though you're not. But people are bound to say that because God gives you that creative wisdom. 
And that's when you are able to receive the finances that are able to save all two thirds of nations, restore the 5,000 people groups, and raise the remnants as summits. That's when you receive the finance of two thirds of missions, the finance of light, and a remnant finance. For remnants, you must live a year of praying and challenging to live a CVDIP. From covenant to practice, you must examine all of that. And when you become, and that's when you become a summit. If you don't have a covenant, if you don't have the word, then that's the end of it. You think you're doing well, you think you're prosperous right now. It has nothing to do with that. It all becomes a few, a few life. But may you hold on to the covenant and actualize and challenge that covenant. And therefore, starting today, starting the first week of January, may you pray about this. A young man was working part-time at a convenience store. A man walked in and asked, do you sell any containers here? The young man seriously answered, no, we don't sell any courage, but courage is in everyone's heart. No, I'm not talking about that kind of courage. Don't you have any lock and lock containers? What are lock and lock? What's the lock and lock? It's a container. It's the brand, a container brand. Encouraged, incurring in the word for container and courage is the same. This is a funny story, but it talks about being spiritually awake and courageous and spiritual enthusiasm. May you start a new year with this. We've been given a new year, and yet there, people don't have that spiritual posture, that spiritual attitude. There's no enthusiasm and enthusiasm, enthusiasm and passion. Then everything becomes useless. It becomes invalid. Another year just passes by. God has given us a precious year. There are still many, all, all big hospitals are filled with patients, but God has given you this health. And God has given you two hands and two feet to do whatever you'd like. Do you think it's all a coincidence? It means that there is a plan of God for that. So may you give thanks. So may your spiritual posture straighten up. And let's look at today's word. What does it say? In today's passage, it shows us Jesus' spiritual attitude that was demonstrated in his public ministry. It was a spiritual posture of concentration and challenge. This is Jesus' spiritual attitude. Today's passage is a long passage. So I've only read the second half and our discussion begins in verse 20. What does the word concentrate mean? It means to come together in one place. And what is that one place? It is going completely all in into God's will and plan. God's will, God's word. That is one place to be in full communication with the word and make a covenantal challenge. That's when we experience God's living work that enlarges our tent. I bless all the believers of Yewon Church in the name of the Lord that you may have a spiritual attitude of concentration and challenge and surely stand as the main figures of the fulfillment of the covenant in 2024. Point number one, Jesus who concentrated on mission actualization. Let's look at verse 20. Then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And this, when his family heard it, they went out to seize him for they were saying he's out of his mind. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom of God to the crowd that had gathered, which made him not have even, even have time to eat. Because various signs and wonders arose at the scene where the gospel of the kingdom of God was being proclaimed. So people who were suffering from unknown diseases, they were healed before the words of Jesus. And so there was an uproar. It wasn't like there were hospitals at that time or medicine at that time. So if you were sick, people just passed away. But when they came before Jesus, they were all healed. And furthermore, those who were demon-possessed, those who were afflicted, came before Jesus, and all those demons were cast out, and they became normal. How surprising would it have been? 
And so there was an uproar in, in Israel. Because whoever came to Jesus were being restored. And because of that, more people started to gather. And the rumor about Jesus spread throughout all of Israel. However, today's passage reveals that relatives of Jesus came out to seize him, to, to seize Jesus. However, what was their reason for that? It was unique. It was that Jesus was out of his mind. We need to look carefully at the expression out of his mind. There are two major perspectives here. One refers to the literal meaning of being crazy. Looking at the passage, we can see that the rumor that Jesus was out, was out of his mind spread throughout Israel. In the latter half of verse 22, we can see that the scribes who came down from Jerusalem to investigate Jesus accused Jesus of being empowered and casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. That he cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub. Since Jesus had such great influence that overturned Israel, they started to spread evil rumors about Jesus. Just like individuals were possessed by demons, Jesus, unless he was possessed by a demon, could, would not be able to cast out these demons and do these unimaginable works. And therefore, Jesus is someone who is out of his mind. That was the rumor that they spread. They thought that he was completely out of his mind. On the other hand, this expression, out of his mind, can be referred to the extreme and intense concentration that Jesus did on his gospel ministry. Jesus was fully focused on the gospel ministry to the point where he did not even have enough time to eat. Moreover, even though the Pharisees and scribes were conspiring to kill Jesus by any means, Jesus was not faced by that. He did not hesitate and preached the gospel of heaven. Even in the face of death threats, Jesus did not hesitate at all, but boldly testified the gospel of heaven. And looking at that, people said that Jesus was actually and completely out of his mind. In other words, he was completely out of his mind in his ministry. And this can be interpreted in two ways. If we were to approach it from a different angle, it shows us that Jesus was completely all in focus on the essential mission of proclaiming the gospel of heaven. People, when it comes to worldly affairs, and people work diligently in that, they perceive that positively. They say, oh, they're hardworking, they're sincere, they're so diligent and faithful. They praise them positively if they're, you know, working crazily for their work and worldly affairs. However, if one works at, if they, one works for the kingdom of God and the gospel of heaven and they go all in into that, they don't look at it positively. They say, you know, that person is strange. That person is completely out of his mind, they say. Just as there were rumors about Jesus being crazy, people may look at you and, and think that you are crazy. They praise people, other people in the world who work hard for their worldly affairs, but for to people who are working and who are working passionately for the works of the kingdom of God and for the church, they talk about them negatively. You know, you think you're the only one who believe in Jesus? I believe in Jesus. You think you're the only one who prays? I pray too. Why, why are you acting as if you're so different? If, if you have that kind of zeal for special things, people call you crazy. But when you take that same zeal to the world, to worldly affairs, people don't say that about you. In Acts 26, Paul, while being bound, he proclaimed the gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ. And at that time, Governor Festus shouts at Paul and says, you are out of his mind because he, Paul was saying things that he couldn't understand. To Paul, who was proclaiming the gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ, he said, you are out of his mind. At that time, Apostle Paul says that he is not out of his mind and that he is speaking true and rational words. 
Then he declares this to everyone in that place. Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. How confident is this confession? It is completely incomprehensible based on the thoughts and values of the people in the world. It goes the same for people who have good faith and people who don't have that type of faith will be completely different. When people who go all in for the church for their position, people, other people may try to stop that, that they, need to, they don't need to do all that. You know, and some people, they come to church and they're not even able to pray. And when it comes to evangelism, they think that's something only crazy people do. You know, or when it comes to missions or devotion, they think, oh, how arrogant must you be to do that? That's how many other churches may be. Traditional churches, churches that have, that have been running for 30 years or 40 years, they're so seized by their frames that they think that all, the, all of that are only for people who are out of their minds. The ministry of renowned evangelist D.L. Moody was based in Chicago. You know, he once used to be a shoe shiner and he received grace and then he became a pastor and evangelist and completely overturned America. At that time, people in Chicago reported called Moody Crazy Moody. That he was crazy. He's someone completely crazy. That's how much he concentrated on spreading the gospel to where he was called crazy. People who believe and go to church moderately, they never would hear these comments. You know, they live a moderate life, doing things all moderately. They don't need to hear these comments. And they may live trouble-free. However, those who really, really believe in Jesus Christ and who really would go all in for the church, and if you really concentrate on that, they can never live a moderate life. There is no such thing as haphazardly or moderate. So I bless all the believers of Yerwin Church that in 2024, that you may go out of your minds, not only in your ministry, but also in your professions. Go out of your minds spiritually, inside your workplace, inside all your professions. That's your DNA. I used to be someone who was quite moderate. I wasn't this or that. But because I was praying and in, my, in the three two days, I now have become, uh, I now have become someone who needs to go to the end, who needs to go all in in everything I do. Just as the Holy Spirit changed Peter and the disciples, the Holy Spirit can change you, and He changes you. All you need to do is go out of your mind. And what do you need to do when you go out of your mind? The composer of the well-known song Messiah, Handel, he's a very famous composer, but this individual, Handel, made a devotion that concentrated on God. And because he was so concentrated, he did not eat a single meal for 20 days, for over 20 days. And people around him said, oh, you know, Handel recently incurred a lot of debt, and now he has completely gone out of his mind. That was a rumor that spread. However, during those 20 days, Handel completely concentrated on God. And amidst his prayer, the song that he received, is the song that you know all well. A lasting masterpiece was born. When you walk a walk of faith and inside your Christian life, if you are called crazy, you've succeeded. Even Edison, the king of inventions, he was so concentrated in his inventions that he lost track of time and even skipped meals because he was so concentrated. 
And, you know, it was to where he couldn't even go, he couldn't even find his way back home because he was so concentrated on his inventions. I'm not telling you that you need to go and starve yourselves. But I'm, I'm suggesting that try to concentrate to that point. When you spend time communicating with God for 24 hours and experience the blessing of the throne, then a life that leaves behind a life masterpiece of the 25th hour in eternity will take place. May believers of Yemen Church waste no further time chasing fleeting introductory things, but may you hold on to the covenants, enlarge the place of your tent, and concentrate on that, and live a life of the main subject. And therefore, I bless that all the believers of Yemen Church may realistically taste the experience of enlarging the tent of your ministries and professions in 2024. Point number two, a challenge that acts according to God's will, verses 31 to 32 reads, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And the crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. The malicious rumors about Jesus had spread throughout Israel. And even his mother and brothers came seeking him after he hearing the commotion. However, when Jesus heard that his mother Mary and his brothers were looking for him, he says, Who are my mother and my brothers? And so, you know, he may have been such a disrespectful son. To his mother, he says, Who is my mother? But that wasn't the point. Alongside these words, Jesus pointed to those who gathered around him and declared, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. A famous scholar said this, who is Jesus? Jesus is God. How, how can God have a mother? How can he have mine or that? He's the Savior who came to save humanity. Isn't that so? Who is my mother and my brothers? Those who do the will of God. What does this mean? Jesus was explaining the concept of a spiritual family. That was what he was referring to. While familial relationships established through biological blood ties are important, now the eyes to see the newly formed family relationships within Christ must be opened. As you go to church, as you live your walk of faith, if all you care about is your own biological family relationships, if you're unable to come out of that level, you're not a spiritual person. A truly spiritual person can go beyond their biological and physical family relationships but become closer with their spiritual family. That's how you must devote yourself. And so you are giving that devotion that is given to your spiritual family, your spiritual brothers and sisters, more than your biological siblings and family, you have to become closer and you must even open your hearts even further to your spiritual family. That's what Jesus is referring to. And there was one condition for becoming a new family. Anyone who acts according to God's will, not because, oh, that person is close to me or I align with that person, well, but whoever Whoever acts according to God's will can become part of this new spiritual family. So all newcomers, listen carefully. Although you may not have been deeply rooted in the church, may you open your hearts. And all the, the spiritual family that God has attached you with, look at the newcomers committee members and look at them and think, oh, God has sent me a new spiritual family. Then what is God's will? At its core, it is believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and receiving eternal life. That is the starting point. When you believe in Jesus Christ, what does God give you? When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God gives you a new life. God gives you eternal life. 
Those who believe in Jesus, the Son of God, have, has eternal life, and those who believe in His name h a s been given the right to become children of God. Although we may be physically citizens of Seoul and Korea, but spiritually we are citizens of heaven. You must know that. And that's we're not physical beings. Although we, li- we have bodies that temporarily live on this earth, but we are individuals who will live eternal life because we have been given that eternal life. John 20, 31 emphasizes this fact. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Amen. So that you may receive eternal life. so that you may receive eternal life. This is the word containing the will and plan of God. Therefore, the very reason for recording the Bible is God's will. Why is the Bible so good? Because you may, so that you may know God's will. You don't understand God's word and you can't see God. And that's why God's given us the word of God. So that by looking at the Bible, we may realize who God is. And we may know who God is and we may know what God's will is. And that is why each and every day we look at the Word of God. Oh, what is God's will? If you do not know God's will and live your lives, that's such an unhappy life. If you do not know God's will, but what must you do? You must be inside the Word, inside today's Word. And furthermore, and there, you must spread the ministry of life continuously. This is emphasized in ver- verses 22 to 30 of the passage. Here, scribes who came from Jerusalem to investigate Jesus accused him of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demon- demons. And at this point, Jesus uses a parable to completely silence them. Mark 3:23 reads, And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? He says, Beelzebub means the king of flies, symbolizing Satan, Beelzebub. However, demons are Satan's underlings. So demons are a plural form and Satan's, Satan is singular. There were angels who were under Satan and they were all cursed and they all became demons. And so Satan, the devil, He's a singular being, but then under him are demons and evil spirits. In other words, can it make sense that those on the same side can expel each other? While saying this, Jesus proclaims a crucial spiritual truth. Mark 3, 28-29 says, Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. This is something very important. He states that every sin can be forgiven. Even if someone may have committed a grand sin, even murderers and all types types of criminals, they are forgiven. And so, even at at the There was a murderer who murdered his, all his entire family, but a pastor evangelized him, and he became a child of God as well. So everyone can receive the forgiveness of their sins. However, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. Those who blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. The ministry of the Holy Spirit moves the human spirit to repentance and leads to salvation. Isaiah 61 verse 1 states, The Holy Spirit is a spirit that grants freedom to the captives. Freedom to the captives. Whatever they may have been captive to, the Holy Spirit grants them freedom. He frees all. However, hindering such salvation work, in other words, obstructing the ministry of the gospel, obstructing and hindering the ministry of the gospel, saying when the gospel is being proclaimed, those who say, oh, that's a heresy or that's strange, and they hinder the ministry of the gospel, that is an eternally unforgivable sin. One that hinders the ministry of missions, they persecute that. People are doing missions, and yet others hinder that and 
and they block those who are going to missions and they mock them and scorn them. A team of three was established, but others, they mock that and hinder that. To hinder and mock the work of evangelism, that is an eternally unforgivable sin. There are many pastors who are committing this sin. There are many denominations and churches who are committing this sin. And many church officers who are doing this. The church, the pastor, they're going, they, they're hindering and blocking and mocking others and stopping them from going on missions. The sin of, of, the sin of hindering that mission and the sin of the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, that is a fearsome sin. May you not commit this sin, even if you cannot understand it. Even if you cannot understand it, just stay still. Just stay still. Just don't open your mouth and stay still. E even if you can't understand the work of proclaiming the gospel, don't say, oh, how could you do that? You don't even have money. You, know, you should know your place. How do you think you will do missions? Do not mock an individual like that way because when you do that you will have to pay for all that sin I've seen that happen uh, those who live according to God's will will follow the works of the Holy Spirit and establish an eternal burden in their lives Jesus also focused on this spiritual aspect therefore All of us who are a part of Jesus' spiritual family needs to become oneness because Satan tries to break this oneness. He tries to break this oneness. Do not live a life that breaks the oneness, but live a life that makes oneness. A child of God that brings peace. So may you follow that spiritual footsteps. It's rightfully natural for this. Only Christ, only the kingdom of God, and only the filling of the Holy Spirit. When this covenant of the three only is delivered to unbelieving souls through yourself, that is a life that lives according to God's will. A life that lives according to God's will. Motivational speaker Zig Ziglar said, There is no elevator to success, but the stairs are always open. What does this mean? Success does not come overnight. All of a sudden. But when you take one step at a time, that's when those doors open. It goes the same for one's spiritual life. When you take one step into the spiritual flow of the pulpit and you meditate on that and you practice that, that's when you experience those spiritual answers. It doesn't come overnight. All of a sudden, that's what, that would be crazy. It doesn't happen that way. But you must follow the word and each day and gradually grow spiritually. A walk of faith that gradually grows each day and that's where the spiritual winner's effect takes place. I bless all of Yeh One Church believers in 2024 that through The challenge that acts according to God's will, you may experience God's scale and you may receive the answer of enlarge the tent of your spiritual and physical life. This is the conclusion. There is a book titled, Be Hot to Move and Crazy to Make It Mine. You must be hot to move and crazy to make it mine. And it has a subtitle that says, Living an Unregrettable Life After 10 Years. The title suggests that one needs to be passionate and live a little crazy to live an unregrettable, li unregrettable life even after 10 years. The book is divided into five chapters and each chapter has a significant meaning. The first chapter says, just looking isn't enough to cross the sea. That's true. And the second chapter says, armor yourself beyond positivity to passion. You must have that passion. And the third chapter says, without a goal, nothing can take place. 
of course, without a goal, nothing can take place. And even if something was to take place, you wouldn't know it. And the fourth chapter says, a dense forest starts with one seed. And the last chapter says, there are clear reasons and laws for success. When looking at these contents, there is one crucial point. It is practice and implementation. Practice and implementation. Even if you say, oh, I believe, but there is no action that follows, then nothing will take place. You can't cross a sea by just looking at it. There must be clear goals and necessary strategies fueled by passion and genuine challenge to see them through. Amen. This is a life of one who lives a correct spiritual life. Oh, you may look at some individual and say, oh, we're in the same church, same pulpit, but how come that person receives answers? It's because that person has practice and challenges. It means that that individual has passion. In 2024, may you have a spiritual concentration and challenge that surpasses any previous experience. When you pray, God makes it so. We're not, relig we're not believing in a religion. There's no, need of uh, there's no need for diligence and zeal. All you need to do is enjoy. Everything is easy. Jesus said that my burden, my yoke is easy. You have that leader, that position that's been given to you, that role, that the role as a, as a leader in different committees and departments. And I, I've realized that there are different, uh, more than 100 different groups in our church. And if you're the head of that, then it means we have 100 or more heads in our church. But that's not a heavy burden because Jesus says, my yoke, my burden is easy. When you receive the word and you pray, God allows you to concentrate and God allows you to implement that. God allows you to do all that. God does not say to, to do something. To do something is religion, but to be that you will become something. That is the gospel. May you have that spiritual challenge, concentration, and challenge. And so for those who've never done this in their life, try this this year. Those who are successful, they had concentration and challenge that allowed them to be successful. And so even without walking up the stairs, if you try to go straight to the elevator, success cannot come. And so when you look at, and so for those who had never tried and worked hard, they, they end up, they end up wasting all their inheritance that their parents had given them because they've never tried working hard before. God gives you these spiritual blessings and answers, but if you're unable to maintain them and receive them, then God will not give them to you from the first place. God will allow you to carry that, to endure that. And so when you have that desperate heart and soul, that earnest heart, God gives it to you. And so all you do is come to worship and say, oh, I believe, but you don't do anything. God won't give that to you. Because God has clearly promised you and God who is faithful to his promise, may you wholeheartedly trust and have faith in that God covenant and in God and may you receive those blessings, all those prepared blessings in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God may all the believers of Yaman Church in 2024 thank you for giving health and for expanding our lives and for allowing us to come together as one unity in this church and for giving us the spiritual atmosphere. May we all before God holding on to the covenant, holding on to the word and concentrate and challenge ourselves in this year 2024 and receive all those answers in this new year. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.